Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, Michael. How are you today? Everything is good? Yes, I'm doing great. Uh, good morning, all of you, and uh, happy to meet you. It's yeah, uh, yeah uh, nine around nine uh, a.m. here in Belgium. So, uh, but I understand it's afternoon. Uh, and you still uh, sleepy, right? Here is a late afternoon, Michael. <laughs> yeah, well, I still okay. Have some you coffee. have coffee. That will be good for you then. Okay. Uh, I hope you are all safe, uh, healthy, and happy. Although everything now is. Yeah, quite tough here yeah, because of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, welcome to the third international general lecture or talk show that is organized as part of PKKM program or program Kompetisi Kampus Merdeka, which is implemented in the Department of Agricultural and Biosystem Engineering. At this moment, uh, I'm going to serve as a moderator for the very interesting topic and title Miniature Chocolate Processing, a Belgian Perspective. As you may know that uh, chocolate is one of the most popular confectionery products in the world uh, due to its unique texture, uh, melting and flow behavior, as well as flavor perceived during its consumption. Uh, conventionally, molten chocolate is, yeah, Produce using a square of mixing, roll refining. Jadi, gitu, ya. nanti saya, nanti the disadvantage of using this method is that the use of mixing, roll refining, and quenching is quite time consuming and need high capital investment, which is then is not suitable for small scale chocolate producer. However, since about 95% cocoa in Indonesia, and actually also in the world, is produced by smallholder farmers. Therefore, small-scale chocolate processing system is highly needed. In this chance, uh, my friend, my colleague from Belgium, uh, Dr. Michael Hine from Cargill, will be elaborating this topic. Before we begin, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Hine. Dr. Michael Hine, I know that now uh, he's currently affiliated with Cargill. Cargill Company, I will just say something like that. A huge company working on food sectors, including cocoa and chocolate. Yeah. Okay, this is Dr. Michael Hine. Yeah. He has years of experience in cocoa and chocolate processing since he did his master uh, and doctoral degree yeah, at the same time as me in this area. Okay. Okay, so this is the Uh, education background of uh, Dr. Michael, uh, Coco Excellence, and KU Leuven, this is as, uh, his master, and University of Ghana, yeah, he did uh, his bachelor degree there, and as I mentioned previously, that uh, Dr. Michael uh, did his PhD uh, at the same time as me at Ghan University, Belgium. Uh, okay, Michael. At the beginning, uh, Dr. Michael will uh, deliver his lecture, and it will be then uh, followed by Q&A session. Yeah? So uh, for you who has a question, you can yeah, write down your questions uh, in the chat box, or you can also raise your hand, and then you can talk directly to Michael. I will give time uh, to you uh, later on. Okay, uh, without uh, further delay, I would like to give the screen and time uh, to Michael. Uh, Michael, please, you can start sharing. All right. I hope everything is fine. Roughly, give me a second. Do you see something? Yeah, it's working now. It's okay? Wait, wait. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And I'm in uh, presentation mode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, nice to meet all of you. And uh, once again, I am super excited uh, to connect with you. Um, unfortunately, we could not do this uh, physically where we could have more time to interact. 
and also share a lot of uh, ideas uh, around cocoa and chocolate, which I think we are passionate, very much uh, passionate about. Uh, but hopefully in better times uh, after COVID, uh, we can uh, connect uh, in person. But in the meantime, I am super excited to have this opportunity to share a little bit uh, with you. Um, this uh, time that I have is obviously not enough to go deeper into everything, especially uh, with aspects related to flavor, with biology or uh, 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 other quality attributes, which are also super important uh, to describe the character of the chocolate. So um, I will take you through uh, a quick journey where I show different steps, uh, what we have done in this area. And uh, afterwards we can share uh, the question and answers uh, that can go across all kinds of uh, uh, scopes. And um, on top of that, I have also provided two uh, publications um, which are directly related to this uh, topic, which you can always also refer to. And uh, whenever you want to get in touch, also feel free either through Arifin or through uh, any of the uh, other uh, opportunities that will be made available. Uh, just a little bit about me. So as you have already heard, uh, I am Michael. I have a um, master in uh, food technology, which was actually uh, where I started this whole journey uh, into cocoa and chocolate and uh, fell in love with it. Uh, and then uh, also did a doctoral uh, program also then in this area, but spe uh, specializing mostly on uh, flavor and aroma improvement and alongside also doing something on miniature uh, uh, chocolate uh, processing. Uh, so this is where I met uh, my very good friend, uh, Arifin, and I think Dimas is also on the line. So uh, hi, Dimas. <laughs> yes, nice to meet all of you. And uh, afterwards, I then continued, I uh, got engaged uh, by uh, Cargo uh, Cocoa uh, and Chocolate here in Belgium, where I am then in charge of uh, product and process uh, development. But at this moment, most of my projects are related to product uh, development. Um, I think it's worth to also mention that we are trying to be very active in Asia region um, as cargo. So uh, we have some few colleagues who are beginning to, uh, I think I have a colleague also in, 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 in Indonesia who is also working directly uh, with me. And uh, quite recently, we also acquired uh, Aust chocolate in Singapore. So still in the neighborhood. So I guess uh, at some point we can also uh, see each other on a business uh, side as well. And of course, uh, I've provided some contact uh, details. Uh, the new generation likes to connect on Instagram so you can find me there. And then if you wanna go the traditional way, you can also write me an email. So uh, I will take you through uh, a bit the content of our discussion. So first a little uh, introduction from which uh, we will then go into more or less the experimental setup of how it was done. Uh, we will discuss a few results, but um, some of the results, the details will also be available for you in the publications of, on your request where you can do further reading. And of course, a few conclusions that uh, we could uh, derive from this uh, study. Uh, so as you know, uh, you probably have heard this a lot from uh, Arifin <laughs> and the uh, cocoa processing steps, which is really, really key. So we always start uh, with a bean. Uh, the cocoa is uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a plant <laughs> because it's actually uh, quite funny. A lot of people in the European region who have not seen a cocoa pod don't really know where chocolate is coming from. So you always have to start from the cocoa pod where you have uh, beans embedded in it. Um, after the uh, pods are harvested, there is a very important step, which is the fermentation step, where um, you set a cascade of all kinds of uh, microorganisms and also uh, my, uh, uh, enzymatic reactions that are necessary to form your flavor precursors. These flavor precursors are the, 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 the peptides and the amino acids and the reducing sugars and uh, the polyphenols and all these uh, compounds, which are developed further in uh, further processing steps to, to develop the flavor which characterizes uh, the chocolate. So a big part of the processing is really uh, uh, at this point of fermentation. 
as you know, there are many st uh, steps, uh, types of fermentation you can do. Uh, this, what you see in this picture now is the heat fermentation, which is mostly practiced in uh, Africa, where um, a bunch of the, uh, the, the beans are pulled together on plantain or banana leaves, and then it's covered uh, on the farm. And then due to the ubiquity of uh, microorganisms uh, in the environment, uh, it's already, the, it is uh, known that uh, the mass is uh, uh, automatically inoculated with uh, these uh, microorganisms, of which, uh, in fact, uh, uh, key ones like yeast and acetic acid bacteria uh, and lactic acid bacteria are playing a bigger role because the conditions set for fermentation do favor their proliferation. So it really, really sets them on the run and then they get to act more. But studies, recent studies have also shown that it's not only these three microorganisms, but there's a couple of other ones who also initially start in their interactions, but then the conditions uh, do not favor them. So of course, they are not be able to uh, express during the uh, system or the process. After this, uh, it is also during this stage that you turn the bean from the typical purple color to the brown color, which is basically an oxidation of the polyphenols, especially the anthocyanidins, which give color to this uh, bean. So you then have your typical brown color, which we uh, uh, connect with chocolate. But uh, that is not enough because after you have created your uh, flavor precursors, you need to then roast it to create all the interesting flavors. And it is doing this uh, roasting process where uh, amino acids are interacting with, for example, uh, free, uh, uh, free amino acids are interacting with uh, uh, reducing sugars uh, to form the well-known uh, Maillard reaction, which is creating all the cooked and interesting flavors and also forming all kinds of interesting uh, volatile compounds, which then also can be tasted or do contribute to the overall flavor of the chocolate. Um, after this, uh, you have uh, roasted your beans. You need to remove the shells because the shells do not really contribute to flavor and it is actually a contaminant. So then it is important to deshell your chocolate. And when you have removed the shells from the roasted beans, you are left with the cotyledons of the, the roasted cotyledons of the bean. And this is what we call the nips. The nips are then grounded into a kind of a, a, a liquid a uh, pasty kind of liquid, which is known as the cocoa liquor, from where you can then add all kinds of uh, ingredients based on the type of chocolate that you're making. If you want a white chocolate, obviously, you will not need cocoa liquor, you need cocoa butter and sugar and milk components. If you want milk chocolate, then of course, uh, it's cocoa butter, milk components, sugar and others, uh, sometimes flavors as well. And if you want a uh, and of course, you also add some liquor, so cocoa mass to it. And if you want dark chocolate, uh, which is more or less what we will discuss in this work, it is basically the liquor plus sugars and other, if you want to add lecithin or flavoring, uh, vanilla extract or whatever to give it a kind of a nice uh, flavor. Afterwards, it's important to, of course, uh, reduce the particle size because the liquor grinding process is not enough. And you have sometimes even in the hundreds of uh, microns, uh, micrometers of particles there. So it will be very, very particulate and taste uh, and sandy. So it is important to refine it. Refining process is basically reducing the particle size. So you can relate to it like uh, the grand, typical grinding process. But in the industrial setup, there are many equipments which are available for this. You can use a three row refiner or you can use uh, a five row refiner as is used in the industry or even other forms as well, which we will discuss later. And then finally, conching. This stage is critical. If you skip if you move from fermentation and you jump to roasting, the next important stage is conching. Why? Because you really, at this point, are needing your chocolate under a specific time and temperature combination, which will help to mature the flavor and also then uh, formalize or uh, 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 make even or even round the flavor profiles that or the volatiles that you have created in the chocolate. Uh, during this stage, you have heard also that uh, you, because of the high temperature that you apply, you're able to uh, evaporate some low molecular weight uh, volatile compounds. Uh, key of them is acetic acid, which is not really nice to have, but not only that, uh, we also know 
from studies that you lose other kinds of flavors, but after, at the end of the content process, you end up with something that is really, really uh, interesting. And that's, you have a, a chocolate that has a, a more uniform uh, flavor uh, properties and also rounded flavors uh, when you taste it. It is also during this stage that you can develop the final uh, rheological attributes of the chocolate. Of course, you can always do something with it after uh, the chocolate is made. You can uh, play with uh, lecithin, PGP, or, or whatever, even particle size to control the, 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 the rheology of the chocolate. But this is really important for uh, flavor. But um, not only this, let me take you back. So most of these, what we have seen in, in the past years is that uh, these always come from industries because you need big equipments, big supply chain, and whatever uh, big uh, systems that you can use to create this chocolate. So for example, the cost of investment is really, really high. Uh, if for someone who is really interested in chocolate, the question is, do I need a big amount of money to start my own chocolate company? And that was the problem that was being faced in the past. Uh, because of that, there has been the attention that is drawn to other alternatives. So other small scale equipments, which can be used then to also create somewhat high quality uh, chocolate. And that gave rise to the bean to bar movement, which you probably have heard that people are becoming more entrepreneurial and are going crazy with uh, and playing around with different ingredients in chocolate to see what they can produce in their own in their own uh, kitchens and uh, and uh, 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 basement. So, for example, you can have a small amount of money to invest in a small equipment, and the idea then would be to put your own signature on your chocolate and to make something that. Uh, is identical to what you or the type of flavor that you want to go for. And so these uh, alternatives have been available uh, in recent years. And now we even see a boom in companies who are also going into this business like uh, Coco Town. But I spoke to a friend in India and now almost all companies are also creating all forms of uh, these as well. So it's very, very popular in India. We have the bore mill, which you probably uh, have heard or have heard of it or have had experience with it because uh, Arifin is the expert in this uh, bore milling process, uh, but it's a more or less a small scale system which handles something around five kilos max, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for processing. Uh, different people have different applications. You can use the bore mill to actually uh, break the nips into liquor. So you see these balls that are moving around and also being uh, shaken at a certain high temperature, friction and also the interaction helps to reduce the particle size. Um, the ball milling process is interesting because not only can you make liquor, but you can also make your final chocolate with it, but you have to adapt your process then. Um, and then you even come to a much smaller scale, which is the Coco Town Melanger, but their Coco Town is just the company who makes this, but there are other companies who also make uh, different types of melangers. And I'll show you uh, details uh, in later slides. Um, it is um, actually a simple system where you have uh, a marble uh, uh, roller, which is moving around, basically grinding the, the nips and the particles uh, during further processing. Um, but the disadvantage here is that you do not have a temperature control unit. So it will be hard to keep it at a certain fixed temperature. But the advantage is that it can run at room temperature because the internal friction that is created whilst you grind the, the nips is enough to keep the chocolate or the, the mass uh, liquid. Because as you know, that uh, chocolate is uh, or cocoa butter, the, the melting profile of the cocoa butter is such interesting that it is uh, solid at room temperature. But if you go something above 35, you're already getting a sharp melting profile where it then liquefies. So it is really an interesting principle over there. And then with the Stefan mixer, this seems to be important also because here the advantage is that you can pro uh, provide uh, a heating system next to it so you can control your shear speed, but you can also control the heating, uh, the, the heating and cooling uh, processes. So that is really key. But the disadvantage here is that you cannot further reduce particle size because the, 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 the system that runs through actually is a cutter and not a, a roller. So it more or less cuts into the system, cuts into the chocolate and you can 
reduce a little amount, but you don't have a significant particle size reduction as compared to the uh, Cocoa Town melanger, or even in the case of the bone milk. So this is how it looks like. If you look inside, you see the balls that I was talking about, sorry, the roller that I was talking about, where it actually runs. And then there's a, a, a plastic uh, scraper, which also puts the sample back into the center and then makes it more homogeneous. But if you look at uh, the Stefan mixer, you actually have a blade which just runs through. So it's more or less good for a conching-like process, whereas the melanger could be interesting for both particle refining and also liquor making because of its ability to reduce uh, particle size. So when we are going to talk about the small scale processing, these are the equipments that we focus on. But of course, the idea is that you get the principle here and then you can apply it to different equipments as in how you, 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 you deem fit because um, it's a matter of seeing what you have and uh, knowing which parameters to play within to have uh, the desired uh, outcome. So um, this work was actually uh, divided into three parts. The first was to look at the grinding capacity of the melanger. So more or less, can we make cocoa liquor with it? Um, and then the part two is that after making cocoa liquor, can we use it as a refining equipment, which is a low cost alternative? And then finally, can we mimic the conching process with the Stefan mixer? Uh, so that if you put all these three steps together, you can make your chocolate from bean to bar with only two simple equipment. So I'll take you through the first uh, step, which is grinding. Uh, what we have done is that we have ground the particles uh, into smaller uh, units. Um, it is basically just putting the samples in there and monitoring the, the time which it will take to see a certain uh, D90 or particles or a certain fineness of the particle. And here we have moved from 30 minutes to 300 minutes. And you see the D90 actually represents the biggest uh, particle sizes in your, in, your, in your liquor. So interesting what we see is that um, we are normally after a time of about 180 minutes, but even going a bit further, you find that you can reduce your particles or even 150, you have something really, really low. So for 150 minutes minimum, you can have particle size that is less than or around uh, 25 microns, which is really uh, interesting. And so we have then compared the profile on a more, to put it in more context to standard and also industrial references. So if you look at the graph on the right, you see uh, the, the big drum for the uh, melanger, but also the mini drum for the melanger, where for comparing different times and also uh, optimal uh, uh, processing, we can find that some of the settings are somewhat similar to industrial reference like uh, cocoa liquor from Vietnam or from Ghana. And uh, on top of that, we have also compared uh, this, uh, the, this profile to what you will get from a standard ball milling process. Uh, and there you also see that if you grind in a ball mill for 15 minutes or 25 minutes, uh, you see the units there that it's not really a big difference in terms of the, the, the profile. And if you compare that to what we have done with the, uh, the melanger, that you can also have something similar with a big drum for 300 minutes or uh, 100 minutes with a mini drum. The difference between the big drum and the mini drum is the size of the cylinder that runs and also the size of the, 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 the marble that, uh, that uh, runs. So more or less the mini drum is a smaller version of the big drum. The mini drum can handle something like uh, 500 grams max. Uh, and then uh, the big drum can go to something around uh, three kilos max. So after this, we then looked at, can we use it for refining. And then we had a setup which we wanted to compare with the classical uh, roll refiner. So um, here we have made two recipes, one with full fat, which is a fat content of something around 40%. And then uh, to, simply, uh, to, to typify the typical or optimal fat content where the melanger has to run. And then we have also created recipes with 25% fat 
which is also the ideal fat content for the raw refiner as is known classically. After this, we have splitted this into different uh, dimensions where for every recipe, we have refined the chocolate uh, with two settings for the three row refiner. So two, one and three, one, which is the gap in, the, in, in between the two rows. So if you pick two, one, two, one is a much smaller uh, distance than the three, one uh, refiner uh, uh, gap. But these two gaps are typically what is normally used uh, on this type of uh, equipment for a really good uh, uh, particle size reduction. And then for the melanger, we have used the mini drum and the big drum also in different applications. If you then go to more or less a condition that is uh, uh, related to what should be the optimal for raw refiner, which is 27%, there we have also repeated the same thing. So we can have uh, a good comparison between the two res optimal recipes, but also to see how the different equipments do behave under these recipes. Um, I have to say that uh, this final one was not continued because we realized that um, if you run the melanger at 27% fat uh, for a, a while, you create so much heat that you can even go above 80 degrees, which then is very detrimental to the, the equipment. So we could not continue there because the heat that was coming out was really too, too much that would damage uh, the equipment. And this is where we got. So we there we also did the same thing, check the biggest particle sizes uh, that are in the samples. And you see that before refining, uh, you have, um, really high uh, particle sizes, uh, D90s. But if you start to using the mini drum, if you go from, uh, if you go from 1.5 hours to 4.5 hours, uh, you see that we have a gradual decline uh, in the particle size. Now, if you pick also the big drum, it's the same phenomenon. The longer you, you, uh, you refine, the smaller the particle size become. And then compared to the three row refiner where we have uh, the, the setting two settings, so three, one, this is what we have. And also two, one is the last uh, result. Here you see um, that with the melanger, we can still with a certain time, we can attain something that is uh, related to the standard or the classical uh, equipment. And even if you go a bit further, you can further uh, reduce uh, your particles to a point which is even much lower than the classical uh, three, row, three row refiner. So there we are aiming at a D90 that is less than 30 microns. Why? Because um, if you have it above 30, uh, microns to be the final finest of your chocolate, it becomes sandy in the mouth. You begin to feel the, the particles when you consume the chocolate. So it's always ideal to go for something in the final chocolate to go for something that is below 30 uh, microns. And here is uh, where it gets interesting because the difference between the, the row refiner, the three row refiner and the melanger, you see these two pictures in the uh, so you look at focus on the image below, you see that with the melanger, uh, whilst it's running, the fat that is being created, it's also mixing with the particles. So what you're getting is actually a more even coating of your particles. So you end up with a, a final product where the particles have not only been reduced, but have also been completely coated. But if you look at the image on top, this is what you see from a raw refiner, which actually just crushes the particles and leaves them as a flake. Um, the danger here is that uh, the white spots that you see, these are sugar surfaces that have been left to the atmosphere. So these are new surfaces of sugar which are not yet coated. So the danger over there is that there is a big chance that these sugar uh, components can absorb some amount of moisture which can then make the, the increase the overall particle size. But even if you keep it for a very long time before you start your quenching process, they can also then absorb more moisture from the atmosphere and then increase the overall uh, moisture content of the chocolate. So in this process, you actually see that it looks even more interesting that with the melanger, you can both reduce particle size, but at the same time also coat these particles with the free fat that is in the system. 
So it's really, really critical. And we found this to be a really, really advantage, uh, a big advantage for this uh, equipment. And if you look at then the images of the particles, uh, I'm here to put some images in perspective uh, to see uh, how it looks like. Um, so the top one is actually um, the cocoa mass and the black uh, components is actually some of the cocoa masses which uh, have uh, uh, come together. Um, if you mix your sugar, then you're, you move to the next image where you find these crystalline uh, substances, which are actually the sugar particles so the first one is just cocoa mass, cocoa liquor. If you add sugar, then you see that the sugars are really big in particles. If you grind it in the big drum for three hours, you see that you have reduced quite some sugar particles. Um, in the mini drum for three hours, you even see a much further particle reduction. And now if you compare to the, the three row refiner to the certain two one, which should actually in theory, give you the finest particles. You see that with a mini drum for three hours, we even go below. And you see this from the previous results that we showed. And uh, on top of that, if you compare the big drum for three hours to the three row refiner, where you have certain two one, you see that you don't find a much big difference in terms of even uh, the, the, the particle sizes as a scene in these, uh, uh, these uh, images. It also gives really interesting results that shows uh, what we have seen already with the instrumental analysis uh, of the uh, particle size. And then the last stage, which I will discuss with you, is the conching uh, stage, because we have now refined, uh, we have created our liquor, we have grounded the, the, the nips uh, with uh, the melange, we have refined with the melange at a good setting, and now the last stage is actually to see how we can also mimic the conching process. To do that, the bigger uh, process, uh, uh, the real classical equipment which we use for reference is the El Colino conch. Uh, this is very much known in the industry for small scale, uh, mid scale uh, production. And it gives really good results that are, uh, ha have a high similitude to what you find in the industrial uh, production as well. Uh, so we use that as the reference, but then uh, next to this, our small scale alternative was the Stefan mixer, where I showed that there you also see that you can uh, control your temperature and even at some point also introduce vacuum to absorb uh, some extra moisture and so some extra uh, compounds uh, as and when it's necessary. This is how the setting was like. So for the first reference, we did everything that is uh, connected to the classical approach. So to refine with the three row refiner and then to conch uh, with the uh, Colino conch. But in the second reference, we wanted to see if we replace the refiner, the three row refiner with our melange refiner and we conch it, what do we get? So here it's the reference one is completely uh, the industrial reference. Reference two is more or less a hybrid between uh, the reference and also the other samples that I will show you because here we have combined one classical equipment, which is the conching process, but combine it with an alternative small scale equipment at the refining stage. So it gives us something in between. And then of course, the other end of the spectrum is to go full blast with melange refiner and next to that, which is a small scale, you go into also conching with a small scale equipment, uh, which is uh, the Stefan mixer. There we have kept the time uh, constant at 60 minutes, which was actually something that was recommended from uh, uh, Dr. Arifin's uh, study. So that was uh, interesting to take some learnings from there. But also uh, temperature, we decided to try 60 degrees and 80 degrees, which also then in most cases are uh, related to the, the temperatures where the conch, the uh, Colino conch is also running on a more classical scale. And then we also decided to uh, see, we wanted to, uh, were curious to see what will happen if we introduce a vacuum pump to the Stefan mixer. Why the vacuum pump? Because the Stefan mixer, as you will see, uh, I think I should uh, show you here, I will come back to it. If you look at the image on the last part, you see that it has a lid. So if you are conching your chocolate, uh, acetic acid and moisture has to evaporate, uh, just like uh, we find in the El Colino conch. So then it is important that here we can also introduce vacuum 
where we can then use the vacuum to suck the uh, extra acetic acid, but also the moisture and whatever components that uh, are being created in the headspace of the of the Stefan uh, mixer. So this is really something that we thought could be related to the classical process where uh, the conch is also open for the evaporation of these uh, acetic acid and other components as well. And that was why we introduced uh, then the vacuum. So there we have introduced a zero, we have a sample which did not have any vacuum connected, but also uh, for 30 minutes, we introduced a vacuum and for 60 minutes, that's throughout the whole quenching process, we also introduced uh, uh, the vacuum. So three different uh, levels as well. And then there's then the last sample, which I call the coex, which is actually something that we were even wanted to go a bit further to see what would happen if you would take only the melanger without your Stefan mixer, and then try to create one compact process. So with the same melanger, you can refine, uh, create, uh, 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 ground your, lick, uh, your, your nips into liquor. Afterwards, you can use the same process to refine your chocolate, but will it even allow us to also use the same equipment for conching? If this works out, then you actually hit the jackpot, right? Because then you have, with one small equipment, able to make or go through the main steps in the chocolate processing uh, processing steps without any extra uh, equipment or so. So we thought this is something to be experimental about and see. So there we use uh, the uh, the melanger. We use it for grinding to conching stage, and the whole process lasted for twelve hours. And this is what we so this is here is some pictures that you can see to put it in perspective. So chalk one is actually the standard one. So we use the standard equipments, uh, Vema mixer for mixing, then refining with the three row refiner and then conching with the alcolino. So classical, there's nothing interesting about this. Now, if you go to the second chocolate, uh, so chalk two, here we have mixed it and then we have refined with the melanger. And then we have conched it with the classical equipment. So like I told you, the hybrid uh, setup that we made. And then in the last one, which is uh, CHOP 3A to 3F, uh, which is actually the different combinations that I showed you in the previous slide. Here, we have mixed it. And then we have refined with the melanger and conched with the Stefan mixer. And here we have introduced, I show another picture where you see the connection of the tubes with the Stefan mixer and the vacuum pump as well. So this is just to put it in perspective for you. And um, here I will go to uh, mainly the, 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 the rheological attributes because this is what is really key. Aside the flavor attributes, these are the most important parameters, even in industrial setup where uh, customers are very interested because it has a direct link with the application. Um, there is um, slightly differences that you see in the, in the, in the trends. Uh, you will read more about this uh, on the publication because there is there we see a big correlation with particle size, moisture content. So I will not go into all of that uh, for the sake of time. But I just want to point out the key things that uh, I think are important here. If you look at the reference one, you have a low yield value. Uh, also reference two has something similar, but here we did not find a significant difference among these. So this was really interesting that we saw. Uh, but the only thing that stands out is the coex, which is the last uh, uh, setup which I showed you. Why does this have the highest uh, yield value? In fact, very, very high. Uh, because um, I, if you remember, I told you that this equipment has no uh, uh, temperature control unit. It's cheap, of course, but you cannot have um, uh, a way to change or to modify the temperature when it's running. So what happens is that you're not able to um, re uh, remove as much moisture as possible. So actually, if you look into the publication and you see the moisture values, you see that this also has the highest moisture content. So this actually attributes uh, to the yield value. So it is here, the phenomenon we see here as more or less uh, a moisture effect. Um, there is also a correlation with the particle size because you can imagine if you have uh, refined your normal chocolate uh, with the melanger for like uh, three hours or even with a three row refiner, which is much shorter time compared to the coex sample, which is running for 12 hours, obviously your particle size is also very, very, very low. So then that can also contribute to the high yield uh, values that we have seen here. But primarily, 
it is a moisture effect. If you go to the viscosity, we see that um, the fat content, the overall fat content in this sample is around 40%. So the, the drive for the viscosity is less of a particle effect, but more of a fat free fat effect. Why? Because at a certain threshold of fat content, uh, the particle size do not play as much bigger roles compared to the free fat that is in the system. And you have to remember that viscosity has a big relation with the amount of fat that free fat that is in the system that is able to help to glide uh, particles over. And why is that? Because uh, with the, all these as other samples, apart from the first reference, all these other samples have been refined with the melanger. And I told you that during the refining process, you're able to reduce particle size, but these particles, this uh, fat, fat uh, particle reduction comes also with the release of fat. The fat does not only just get locked in the matrix, but it is also evenly distributed to coat all the particles. So at the end of the day, you have a much better coating even from the refining stage before you go into the crunching process, which helps very much with the reduction in viscosity, mainly because you have properly packed your particles in the matrix to have as much free fat in the system as possible. And that is why we see a big advantage there because then you can have samples where the uh, rheology is or the viscosity is much, much uh, lower. But of course, I have to say that the, the significant uh, differences in this was not uh, that great. So um, I will not be very conclusive comparing uh, reference one, two for the, the rest and say this is significantly big, but it's just to show you already a trend that this could be something that is interesting. And then um, with flavor, I'll just talk quickly about flavor but not so much because uh, I give a full overview of all the volatile compounds that are, were identified from these samples. Not only that, but uh, not the other active ones, but also another table which shows all the, every compound that has been extracted from this uh, chocolate. We also have to show them the abundances or the amounts, which can then give a much bigger picture. But okay, if you select the interesting ones, the popular volatile compounds, which do um, speak into the overall flavor of the chocolate, you find that um, a trend basically, that uh, first you find more or less a grouping around the references where the volatile compounds are very much less um, compared to the other side where the volatile compounds seem to be more intense. Why? Because there we are only conscious for one, uh, one hour, that's 60 minutes. And we are introducing some amount of vacuum, but not that much. So for example, if you see the samples that had the high amount of volatile compounds, they were the 80 degrees and 60 degrees where there was no vacuum because we did not use vacuum to absorb any compound from the chocolate. So it makes sense that you see them that are those that are clustered more closer to where the volatile uh, compounds are, indicating that they are the ones that are more intense in these compounds. But on the other hand, if you look at the reference one and reference two, where it was conched for six hours in the alcoholino, you see that we have evaporated as much uh, volatiles as possible. And then of course, uh, anything between 30 to 60 degree, uh, minutes falls within uh, the, 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 the space uh, between the, the, the two extremes. So the references and also the samples that were conched for a very short time, but without vacuum. And so all the other vacuum treatments are also found in between uh, there. Something that is really interesting is acetic acid, which is an impact, has an impact on the flavor. And so as much as we can remove acetic acid, the better for us, which means that for samples that if you would use the Stefan mixer, you will realize that you still have quite some high acetic acid, especially if you do not uh, use vacuum to evaporate uh, or to absor absorb uh, these, uh, these uh, components as well. But of course, uh, it is uh, a minor setback of the small scale uh, uh, equipment um, and processing method as a, as a matter of fact. Um, something that I have to share on the flavor as well is that we did not only do instrumental analysis because this is very, very sensitive. But something that was really, really interesting for us, which gives us also more confidence is that though you see 
that the instruments are able to clearly differentiate between the acidity and also the other volatile concentrations compared to the references. We have done a tasting session with 112 consumers who just tasted representative samples from these three clusters. So one sample from here, one sample from here, and one sample from here. And uh, the result that came out was that they could not find a big difference between these samples. What does it tell us? It tells us that um, it seems like the on an instrumental level, the flavor profiles might be different because of course the instrument is very, very sensitive to find the exact concentration. But if people can taste these samples, to be, as a matter of fact, you cannot find a big difference in the samples, which is really something interesting for us. So um, it is also, it has an impact, small scale uh, processing has an impact on the quantum process, definitely. But here, um, I think more uh, work needs to be done in this area to see which particular flavor profile you want to go for, and then how to tune your processing to, to suit uh, that. So just a few wrap up of uh, the stages that we have gone through. So for example, with this part one, where we looked at uh, the, 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 the grinding uh, capacity, uh, we could conclude, of course, that uh, the melanger uh, used for grinding was able to help for sufficient uh, particle reduction. Something that you must know is that the cost uh, in terms with time and energy has to be evaluated. Because on the one hand, uh, the classical equipments can move really fast with a matter of minutes, but uh, you uh, you could see that, uh, for example, with the melanger, you needed about three hours to have something really, really low. So here is actually a matter of uh, cost uh, benefit uh, analysis to see also the impact uh, of the energy that you spend and also the time that you spend to do it. But uh, as a, if you would ask if it is actually a suitable alternative, the answer would be yes. For refining, it is also good uh, for refining. And in some cases, we have even seen that there is a better coating of the particles compared to the three row refiner. But again, uh, you have to evaluate this result in the, in the framework of uh, how much cost or how much time do you have as a small scale producer to spend on one production. And then finally, a quantum like process in the Stefan mixer is also able to mimic the standard equipment, which is something really interesting. We find slight difference in the instrumental volatile analysis, but when you do a sensory tasting, you see that there is actually not uh, differences uh, there uh, compared to the reference. So that was also really something that we thought was a high point. And like I said, uh, so um, in these two publications, you will see the full details with all the results, other uh, quality attributes that have also been evaluated, correlations that have been made, the trend uh, with respect to time and temperature with the, uh, the Stefan Mixer process is also available. You can see all of this uh, for free. And with this, I would like to say that whatever your uh, question is, uh, the answer is chocolate. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Michael. <laughs> You have explained the details of chocolate production, the influence of chocolate processing, proce processing steps, which is quite complicated, I guess, <laughs> for some of the participants. Yeah, after this, uh, yeah, I think you can uh, explore or uh, explain more if the participants still have a question. Perfect. Uh, but before we start the Q&A session, I think I need to summarize some important points from the presentations you gave us uh, as follow. The first one is that uh, post-harvest uh, processes are very important. Uh, fermentation generate a flavor precursor, roasting develop aroma of chocolate, and conching creates chocolate with good textural characteristic flow properties and also aroma profile. Second one is that small-scale chocolate processing is very effective for producing chocolate in small amount, uh, about two to five kg, yeah. yeah. Profile of chocolate, PSG or particle size distribution made with melanger is quite similar with the ones produced with industrial ball mill. I think after this, you can explain more also. And conventional chocolate processing machines. The last one is that moisture content highly influence the Passon heat value and Passon viscosity. 
Okay, after this, or now is the time for the discussions. I will start with the question uh, from the chat box, if there is any. Well, there are some questions, Michael. You can also read it by yourself, but I think, yeah, I think it's better for me to yeah. read it for you and then you can you go can through the chat. Yeah, okay. The first questions coming from Dimas Rahadian. Hello, Dimas. Thank you for coming. Hi, Dimas. <laughs> to yeah, to Dr. Michael. Yeah. Based on your experience, how is the best processing methods to make a good chocolate in terms of particle size and flavor? Using Coco Town Melanger, totally, or without, uh, yeah, combined with Stefan mixers, or maybe, yeah, yeah you, you know that normally, as, as you mentioned, that you also need a Stefan mixer to evaporate the moisture. Yeah, yeah please. Um, I... I kind of missed a bit uh, the main question uh, here. Uh, you can read it by yourself, no? Okay, I, I, I will read it again. Yeah, based sorry. on your experience, how is the best processing method to make a good chocolate in terms of particle size? It is better to use melanger alone or you, you need to combine melanger with, with other means. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Dimas, for your question. Um, I would say both. Uh, both because uh, in this uh, study, we try to mimic uh, an industrial setting. And of course, with a, a reference chocolate, you have certain specifications, right? So uh, certain rheological attributes, certain fineness, which is always the target. So in fact, if you want to go in that direction, it is better that you combine uh, the melanger with the Stefan mixer. And you also saw from the flavor profile that the more of vacuum that you introduce, the more you are moving from the left, uh, sorry, yeah, my right, to the other side, which is closer to the references, so which is interesting. But um, if you say the best chocolate, it is uh, something that is quite uh, a discussion. Why? Because uh, the best uh, chocolate um, depends on which application that you would use it for. Uh, if, for different customers as well, you can have uh, what is known as the best. Um, I know there are some customers uh, from experience, some customers who prefer chocolate that is has less acidity. But on the other side of the world, there are some uh, customers who also like to have a bit of acidity and dryness in their mouth when they eat their chocolate. So for example, based on the customer that you want to serve or what your flavor profile is, you can decide whether to use them in combination or just stick to only the melanger. I would only stick to the melanger if I'm using it on an application where I don't need uh, a lower uh, moisture, uh, sorry, a lower moisture content and a lower rheological attributes. For example, something on biscuits, you need a high yield value. If you want to include it in biscuits or in croissant or in other types of application where you're going to apply more heat uh, uh, in the process. So in fact, uh, the answer is that both is good to mimic the industrial setting, but based on your needs, you can also then decide to go for the, the, the one with only the melanger, which is much cheaper. I hope I was able to capture a bit, or if not, uh, you can follow it up uh, with uh, the question if it's uh, not uh, that clearly explained for you. Okay, hey, thank you, Michael. I hope the answer is yeah, good enough for Dimas. Or if you have uh, oh, Dimas. another question, Dimas, of is the explanation from Michael is not clear enough. Okay, you can yeah. also okay thank you. It's Michael. very clear, and yeah, I'm so happy to meet you again, Michael. So <laughs> then, my question is because in Indonesia, normally uh, the small scale industry only have a melanger without Stefan mixture. According to you, is it possible? Is it possible to make a good chocolate, let's say chocolate bar, yeah. only using yeah. melanger without Stefan mixture? What do yes. you think? And and how is the processing the best processing method in terms yeah. of particle size and also the uh, flavor? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say uh, first of all, in this now understanding from this uh, aspect, if you say you don't have the option to go for a Mel uh, Stefan mixer, I know a lot of bean to bar producers indeed only use the the melanger. What they do 
is that um, if you want, but of course uh, you know that you cannot do much with uh, removing acidity from the chocolate. So normally the best way is to put, already start with a high quality cocoa bean. And for example, then I would, in your bean selection, you can go for a medium uh, acidic uh, bean compared to a very high acidic bean. I'll give you an example. If I want to pick uh, beans from, uh, let's say, if I have an option to use beans from uh, Ecuador, which is more mild in terms of acidity versus beans from uh, Vietnam, which is quite high acidic. Then of course you see that uh, with the melanger you can use the same process, but your end product, this will become more acidic than the other. So first of all, it starts with your bean selection, but you know that you can also influence your acidic, uh, acetic acid concentration through your roasting process. So if you know that you don't have a, a good, uh, uh, system to conch it, to remove it, then you have to do as much to remove more acids at the roasting uh, stage, which means that instead of applying a milder roasting process, I will rather apply somewhat uh, mid or high roasting protocol so that you can remove as much acetic acid as possible. Don't burn your beans, by the way. <laughs> and then um, afterwards, uh, I would propose then that you can run with the uh, Steph, uh, the melanger, but then I will not go for something less than uh, 10 hours. I will keep it running for a while. Why? Because, and I know some people who even run it for like a day or two, so 24 hours. Why? Because um, you, you are only compensating now. The only way you can remove acetic acid now is not through the temperature, but through aeration. So the more it keeps running and the more it keeps running for so long and you keep reducing the fat, uh, the, uh, you keep uh, reducing particle size, you are creating more higher surface area for acetic acid that was trapped in the, in the system to be evaporated. But to, not by the action of heat, but by the action of aeration, which means that the longer you keep it running, the more you can get rid of more acetic acid at a very slow rate compared to if you would have used the high temperature. Uh, okay, sorry for interrupting. Thank you. I got yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Michael, how do you think you know that actually we can also use like a heat gun? How do yes. you think about that? Is it is it good or not? Because you know that the temperature of heat gun is very high. Sometimes can be more than hundred degrees C, and you know yeah. it might broke the you know the chamber. How do you think Indeed. about that? Indeed, uh, heat gun is good to always uh, use this for a very short time to keep your system a bit uh, liquid. So it's more or less, I, I call it the temperature corrector. You use it to actually correct the temperature. If your room that you start grinding is quite low, now it's summer here in Belgium, so average temperature is high. If I will start to uh, grind my samples out there, it will still be liquid. But if I want to, I'm working in, let's say my kitchen, and then I want to still start to grind, in winter, the temperature will be very low. So I will need a heat gun to bring it up a bit. So the heat gun, I think its main role is to actually help to push, give it a little push until you set it in motion. And sometimes if there is a temperature drop of two degrees or five degrees, you can always use it to, to heat it up a bit. But it should not be the source of heat for the operation of the melanger. Why? Because uh, remember during the refining, I told you that when we go above 80 degrees, you can really destroy the equipment. And so if you can imagine that if you point your heat gun for so long, you're heating the equipment, and then it, uh, if you go beyond that, you can, uh, you can destroy it. So heat gun is good, but uh, it needs to be used uh, basically for temperature correction. OK, thanks. Very clear. Uh, I see that there is participant raise uh, her or his hand, and I think it's the, yeah. We will ask you directly the question. Okay, right. for Amanda Gifari, uh, please, you can ask your question directly to uh, Dr. Michael Hine. All right, let's go for it. All right, let's go for it. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, please. Okay, please. Okay, so I'm interested in this topic, especially um, I'm currently interning in a place 
where um, this is a small scale production for chocolate yep. and I'm interested to match like uh, the cases like I'm reading from your journal and uh, the reality here so so here um, I think I think that um, uh, cost is really a main obstacle here. So I'm, I, I wanted to ask like, how, as a chocolate uh, chocolatier, how do you, uh, how do we choose where to invest? Um, so I heard that um, you also give tips to whether to choose beans, the beans itself, or to choose like which uh which sweets the place the most like for mm -hmm. example um yeah. my place here yeah. is act um yes yeah please continue please go ahead yeah. please, please go ahead okay so my place here is actually quite humid and it's quite hot so when crunching when crunching is is really the uh, temperature is really um what it go it goes high and low sometimes so i asked the owner like where do they want to invest and uh, they uh, stated that um like the melanging need more upgrades so but i also think that the beans here could be uh could be better for example that you said that we uh, we can choose beans that are optimal like low acetic acid but at the same time it's quite um it's quite a tackle it's quite obst obstacle here to tackle like which one do you want to give uh more thoughts into for example that here the conching uh, like the, the melanger here um doesn't actually have the vacuum and they just left it there for six hours like almost three days um so we don't really see like uh, the the difference in particle size distribution, but yeah. So how do you tell which one to that gives more optimum results, like with minimal cost for um, small scale to mimic the industrial scale? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. I'm happy for your experience also because uh, indeed it puts uh, everything in perspective, right? I think uh, uh, for you and other people on the call that um, that you have had a practical experience, you can also really connect these results to uh, uh, what you see on the ground, which I'm very happy for. So thanks for your question. Um, in terms of where to look at, indeed, I will always uh, highlight that if you have a limitation uh, to improve your content process, then already start with a high quality product uh, because whatever you put in is what you get at the end uh, of, your, of, your, of your, your processing. And um, the melanger indeed, we are still in the first generation melanger uh, uh, productions, which means that all the ones that I've seen from the different companies still are not able to create a heat exchange or heat uh, controlling unit next to it. Well, for some of the innovative minds, it could be the next business uh, to jump on. Uh, but um, until we have that, uh, you cannot really do much with evaporating as much acetic acid and moisture. So then I would actually look at the beans that are being uh, sourced. Uh, so you can say, okay, if the, this company has the option to select from different suppliers, which type of bean uh, that they can buy or from the farmers, then you can already start your quality assurance process from there by actually checking the pH and the acidity of the beans. And then you can make a decision to say, okay, I want to only buy from suppliers who only have uh, less pH uh, because the, sorry, less acidic uh, beans, because uh, a big part of this is coming from the, the fermentation process. Or I don't know the situation with your company, but if they have their own plantations or they even have connections with some of the local farmers, 
then they can even go a step further to work with them at the fermentation stage. So as a company, you should not only buy your beans, but you should be interested in what happens to the beans before you, it's sold to you. So there you could also play around with a lot of uh, uh, different roasting protocols, heat fermentation or tray fermentation or box fermentation, or try the, how long you ferment your bean and at which conditions to see if you can have a bean that is optimally fermented, but is less acidic. Then you can actually carry these beans into your production and you realize that you will have a kind of chocolate where the acidity is not high to begin with. Uh, if you also want to reduce moisture in your final chocolate and you cannot do it with a the melanger, then you should start with the low moisture beans. You should also source your raw materials, for example, where you get your crystal sugars from or where you get uh, icing sugar, whatever. You can also control this with the supplier. What is the moisture content of my raw materials? Can you, in your processing, can you reduce it so that I can only start with uh, uh, raw materials that have low moisture content. In that case, then you do not have to worry too much about removing more moisture from the final chocolate, you see? So in your case, I'll really go back to the beginning and see the quality of my raw materials because I know I cannot do much with my uh, quenching process. And of course, if you're roasting your beans by yourself, then you can also then play a bit with the, the time temperature combination over there. Hey, thank you, Michael. I think that's very clear answer. Sit oh. enough, I hope, for uh, Amanda Rifari. You know that actually uh, says my student. Oh, really... <laughs> Amanda is yeah. a student. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um. That was a clear answer, and I, I understand you. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, Michael, the next question is. Uh, this is the short one. Does the different types of cocoa beans affect the refining and punching time required? I will start with the last part. Yes, different types of cocoa bean affect the conching required because uh, like I said, acidic beans will need more conching to remove acetic acid. Uh, uh, but also uh, uh, high moisture content beans where the roasting is not able to remove sufficient moisture, then you also need high temperature in your conching to remove the moisture. So that's also important. But now if you come to refining, uh, the refining is not so much related to flavor uh, as the conching step. It is actually just a simple mechanical process of particle reduction. So, which means that normally whatever bean you put in your refiner, you should be able to refine it, but then the difference will arise uh, not actually related to the, the, the variety of the bean, but actually to the quality of the bean. Because if you have beans that is highly roasted, the nips are very much crisp. So the refining process goes smoothly and you're able to release more fat. But you have poorly roasted beans or beans that have high moisture content, your refining will be difficult because it will still be very hard to break these nips. So it is actually the difference in the, in the bean is not so much related to the variety, but to the quality to start with. But of course, if you have beans with different quality, then you have to adapt your refining process. But more importantly, for flavor sake, you have to adapt your content process as well. Hey, thanks. That's also very clear, I, I guess. Another question, Michael. Uh, this is from Safira from Bawijaya University. Uh, it's Jaffa. Uh, do you know Ash Content? Ash Content. In the press, yes, uh, yes. in the industrial perspective, yes. uh, is it uh, really, really important? And yeah, how to good. remove it? And then afterwards, uh, can small scale chocolate processing remove Ash Content? Okay. Uh, your ash content is related mainly to your minerals that are left uh, during the roasting process. So it's more related to the roasting process. And so uh, whether you are an industrial uh, processor or small scale processor, you only have to look at the roasting process when you want to think about ash uh, 
content or in a typical industrialization process you can look at alkalization but that is not really important for a small scale producer so it's related to your roasting process uh, typically if you roast so higher you're going to have high ash, ash content if you roast less you have less uh, ash content that's it okay so that's yeah. also very clear yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, this is from Reza. Reza is currently a student at the Department of Agricultural and Biosystem Engineering, Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, as mentioned before, extra acetic acids were produced during processing, especially during Stefan mixing. How long it takes, I mean, for the vacuum pumping to remove it? Um... From these studies, we did it from zero to 60 minutes, but we saw a, a still a good uh, decline with the time. So if you're doing further studies, you can go for 90 minutes or you can go as long as possible. The idea is to reduce as much acetic acid as possible, and it goes directly in relation to how long you vacuum. Uh, but in the in my paper, you will also see that uh, I show a trend where there you actually see the decline with the point. So you can follow the graph to see where there is a steep decline and where it starts to taper off in the in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the concentration. Yeah. But indeed, uh, the idea is that the longer you ref you you vacuum, the longer you remove acid. There are more acetic acid you can remove, but how much exactly how much would depend on what uh, you want the product to look like right yeah okay uh, next one uh, this is from farid abadi i would like to ask about raw cocoa sources from global market which are the best and which have the lower grade how is the quality of raw cocoa from southeast asia especially from indonesia compared in yeah compared to the others you know that uh, in Indonesia, we, yeah, many times uh, people say that Indonesian chocolate is not good. How do you think about that? Because you know, yeah, you know that uh, in Indonesia, we have also Kargil. And yeah. maybe you can, yeah, you can see this as a representative from Kargil. Let me be politically correct and say Indonesian cocoa is the best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer the question? <laughs> but no. uh, I think uh, in general, in fact, uh, we have, um, as you know, the different uh, grades, right? For cocoa yeah. on the international market, based on variety, we have the fine flavor. I think Indonesia is beginning to produce some fine flavor as well, right? Yeah. And you yeah. Have, uh, as a rule of thumb, the fine flavor is always of higher quality than the, the bulk uh, cocoa. So depending on which uh, category you're in, you already know where you belong. But when it comes into inside the fine flavor or inside the bulk, I think uh, there, there could be many differences, not only in terms of the flavor, but the quality attributes. How well is this fermented? How, how long is it fermented? Uh, what is the acidity? I mean, all these components play a big role. And I guess um, that even differs from uh, person to person. So. Um, uh, it will be very unfair for me to say, for example, uh, Ghanaian cocoa is better than Indonesian cocoa because there are some beans from certain parts of Ghana that are not good, but there are some beans from Ghana, certain parts that are better. And I'm sure there is the same thing from uh, Indonesia, some beans coming from some region that is much better than other regions as well. So um, without uh, trying to start a political game, I think uh, let's give the the first price to Indonesia. <laughs> but I guess you, you more or less get where I'm coming from. And uh, the point I want to make is that uh, basically um, you need to know where you're sourcing your bean, taste it yourself and ask yourself, is this what I want for my chocolate? Because whatever goes into your production is what comes out in your chocolate. So if you have moldy and very burnt flavors and very off flavors in your cocoa bean, you cannot remove everything during the process. You end up, always end up with something in the final product. So you really have to take care of uh, where you source your bean. Okay. 
yeah there are some uh, questions left i think i will i will just choose two or three yep. okay uh, okay this is another question from Eti indarti i think uh, the things that she want to know is uh, can we treat the acidity of the chocolate produced by melangers uh, with the alkalization process yeah you, you said before that <laughs> we don't need to do that actually but is it possible yeah, yeah. but if you want to if you have a small rooster and you want to apply a bit of alkali uh, you can you can do that as well just that it's uh, it seemed to be a very uh, yeah expensive uh, process and then you also end up with something that is more industrial but uh, i guess let's not lose focus that the main reason why the bean to bar movement started was that people wanted to be different from what is coming from industry because there you control everything from beginning to end so you know what you can put in based on what you want so then uh, if you start to do everything exactly like the uh, industry then you do not differentiate yourself in any way right so um it, that is why most uh, bean to bar do not go in this direction, but then they play more with their roasting intensity and also with their conching process to have something that is a bit uh, different. But in fact, if uh, this is the goal of what you want to do, then you, and you have the capability to do this, uh, it's it will, it's uh, alkalization is always good for the acidity, right? I mean, this is uh, very well known in the in the in literature. Okay, Michael, uh, Eti Indarti also, yeah, she asked more questions. Uh, the question is, what is the influence of particle size of sugar crystals? You mentioned many times that, okay, using this method, the particle size is big and, and small, and then mm -hmm. you, you know you said something like that, but you didn't tell us about what's uh, actually the influence of particle size on the chocolate quality. Um, it, it, it's, it's, Particle size of the sugar on chocolate quality, that is quite broad, but I'll try to touch little parts of it. Um, because when you talk about quality, my mind goes everywhere. Everything can be captured as quality. So let's talk about quality in terms of moisture content. No, quality in terms of uh, flow behavior first. If you have high sugar content, uh, high uh, uh, particulate uh, sugars, uh, of course, which is not able to be refined, obviously you're going to have a very sandy chocolate because you saw from the images that I showed that the crystal sugars really stand out really big. So although you can have uh, quite uh, some sugar crystals being in your chocolate, the, the tasting will not be the best. So the, the lower you can get, the better. That is in terms for the rheology, but also for the taste in the mouth. Um, again, if you have high uh, particle con sizes, obviously, um, your rheology is going to be impacted. In most cases, if you have high particle size, you have lower specific surface area. So your rheology reduces. So that could be an option. Uh, if we talk about uh, impact of crystal sugars, uh, the size particle sizes as is related to the flavor of the final chocolate, then obviously there also, if it's too big, then you don't have an even distribution of bitter to sweetness uh, uh, index because you always, for every amount of bitterness that you taste from the liquor, you want to balance it with the sugar. But if it's not well uh, dispersed in the sample because you have really big portions of it, you can imagine how it's going to taste. But at the end, you want to have an even sweetness in your, on your tongue. There is also a hypothesis that um, the sugar crystals, when they are broken down, do absorb some flavor volatiles on their surfaces and do hold to these flavor volatiles. So for example, if you have sugar that is highly refined and then you go into conching, it tastes more better because the sugar surfaces can also attract some of these nice flavor volatiles and keep them in the chocolate compared to if you will taste a, ch uh, a chocolate that has only very hard crystalline sugars that are not even further refined. You see, so these are the impacts on the different aspects of rheology in terms of uh, uh, flavor, but even for moisture because sugar is very highly hygroscopic. So if you have high moisture content and you have uh, 
uh, of course, uh, crystalline sugar that is now, if the surfaces are now exposed, of course, then you're also going to have sugar sugar uh, interaction, which is going to make the chocolate very uh, 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 sandy. You are on mute. On mute, sorry. Yeah, actually there are a lot of influence of sugar. You yeah. didn't also, you didn't explain about the agglomeration and so on, but I know because, yeah, because of the limited time. Now mm -hmm. the time here is around uh, 3.30 PM yeah. and yeah, in Belgium, 10.30, I guess. 10.30, okay. yeah. Yeah, 10 30. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Michael. The time is about to finish. And yeah, today we learned a lot of things about uh, small scale chocolate processing. Uh, I hope the information you give you gave uh, will add the knowledge of the attendants here. Yeah, to my student. And also, there are also some yeah, lecturers from other university as well. Uh, furthermore, I hope this can help us yeah, to improve the quality of Indonesian chocolate, especially uh, the one produced by small and medium enterprise. And uh, before we end this talk, uh, yeah, for the committee, uh, we have a certificate as a token of gratitude. Is it ready? Okay, I hope there is no technical problem anymore. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Please wait for a moment. Okay. Wow. Wow. You look so great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Michael, again. So uh, once again, on behalf of the Department of Agricultural and Biosystem Engineering, I would like to thank you for your time. Have Thank a good day. Very much. Or if you have you yeah, something to say, you can also do that. I hope uh, in the next time we can collaborate more. Okay. Yes, I'm very happy for this opportunity, of course. And uh, thank you for all the time that we uh, spent together. And uh, really looking forward to uh, connecting with you in the future on more subjects. And uh, yeah, um, feel free to connect with me uh, whenever you are. Uh, you want to have a question or you you have something else in mind yeah. okay michael there is a question uh, is it okay to share your presentation your ppt to the attendance to the audience yes uh, you can share it indeed okay yeah. yeah thank you thank you okay sorry again on All right. <laughs> okay, I'm so gonna, for I'm the gonna. participants, for the attendance, this is the end of this event. So before we end, uh, yeah, this program, I think we can, yeah, as usual, Michael, a picture, picture, <laughs> taking picture together. Maybe the committee can yes. ask me, us to, yeah, to take the picture. Okay. Okay, I will help counting. Or, or somebody? Mas Mapul, ada yang bantu nggak ini biasanya foto? <laughs> if no, I will do oh, that. Oh, biasanya. <laughs> oh, done? Oke. Oke ya. Could please? Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah, I see. Oke, okay, only several participants. Open the camera. We need to wait for a while, I guess. Okay. 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 Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Wait, wait. Okay. I think that's enough. Okay. Michael, ready? Everybody ready? One. Two, three. Okay, one more, please. Wait. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, that's enough, I guess. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we still have uh, several talks uh, in the next yeah next week. 
I think we will organize something like this until early October. Please follow our YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook channel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Have a good day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.